Hello, Cross Life. Welcome to our first ever live stream service. For our first announcement today, we will be uh, meeting next week at 4 p.m. The reason why we chose to meet at 4.30 p.m. today is just so that we can let everyone get situated and those who accidentally went to Voyagers would have enough time to go back home and, and pull up the live stream. So next week we will be meeting at 4 p.m. And then also every uh, event for church will be suspended until further notice. For now, we'll just be meeting digitally for our Sunday service. And lastly, we, we will be having our members meeting at 6 p.m. today after service. So for our church members, please be on the lookout for the email that will be sent out containing the link to our members meeting. And for our scripture reading today, we will be reading Psalm chapter 38. Verses 12 to 22. Starting at verse 12. Those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. But I am like a deaf man. I do not hear. Like a mute man who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear, and in whose mouth are no rebukes. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. For I said, only let them not rejoice over me, who boast against me when my foot slips. For I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity, I am sorry for my sin, but my foes are vigorous, they are mighty, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good accuse me because I follow after good. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Join me in prayer. Lord, may we just trust in you during this time of uncertainty. And may we recognize and remember that you are sovereign over all things. And so that, God, we can trust in you because of that. God, may we just find comfort and peace in you. And may you grant us wisdom as we just try to navigate through this time the best way we can. And to just be good stewards of what you've given us. And to also be good witnesses to the people around us. So, God, we thank you. We love you, and we pray for all these things in your son's name. Amen. Uh, Good afternoon, Cross Life. Please join me in a time of prayer, or praise. Tis so sweet. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. And to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know, thus saith the Lord Oh, how sweet Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus just to trust his cleansing blood just in simple faith to plunge me neath the feeling cleansing flood jesus 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 how i trust him how i've proved him more and Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, tis sweet. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus. 
Just from sin and self to cease Just from Jesus simply taking Life and rest and joy and peace Jesus, Jesus, Jesus How I trust Him How I proved Him more and more Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust Him more I'm so glad. I'm so glad I learned to trust Him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that He is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him. God sent his son. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love. Heal and forgive. He lived and died. To buy my pardon. And Because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know. Cross the river, I'll fight my fight. No war with pain, and then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory.
because he lives and life and life is worth the living just because he Join me in a time of prayer. Uh, God, um, despite these uncertain times, Lord, we praise you in faith um, and with thanksgiving, for you are faithful to us, um, daily giving us the strength to live in the truth of the gospel um, and reminding us of our hope of resurrection, Jesus Christ, our righteousness. Uh, lead us by your spirit to live in ways that bring you glory in this time. In your name we pray, amen. Good evening, Cross Life. Uh, am I on? Am I on? Okay. Um, good evening. This is uh, pretty weird. <laughs> I'm talking to a camera right now. I've got a few guys in the room right now. Um, but we are grateful that uh, we just have an opportunity uh, and the means to actually worship together digitally, at the very least. And um, it's, 
really by God's grace, even in, the, in all this craziness. But, uh, you know, before we, uh, before we begin, uh, join me in town prayer. Dear God, uh, even though all this is happening, uh, we know that you are sovereign over um, this pandemic. Nothing happens apart from your will. And we're also reminded of your great power and your omnipotence as within a span of a few months you have brought the entire world down to its knees. And um, we are reminded again that we are but creatures before the great creator. And Lord, even though we are small and even though we are insignificant, you have loved us and you keep us. And you have even sent your own son to come and die for us, to resurrect from the dead in order to give us life. Lord, as we think about uh, times like this, may we ultimately entrust ourselves to you and to worship you and to, and to believe that you will work out all of this uh, for your glory. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's, uh, again, it's, uh, this is really new. It's uh, quite interesting. Um, because of the coronavirus, we are live streaming our sermons. And uh, I guess in some sense, Cross Life has become a, a multi-site church. <laughs> so that's kind of, uh, that's kind of uh, weird. Uh, in any case, and when I think about everything that happened this past week, it was uh, just crazy how fast uh, things escalated. Last Tuesday, I told the students at the office hours that I would see them at CCF, but you know that, that day, uh, I found out that the UCI, UCI school just announced that they would have finals remotely and that next quarter, the students would be, I guess, doing school remotely as well. And then, and so we decided to just uh, cancel CCF. And you know, then we found out that the NBA got suspended, Tom Hanks tested positive for the coronavirus, and can't even get toilet paper at, at Costco anymore. And so it's like, you know, things got, things got pretty, pretty serious. Um, and so, you know, we even canceled the retreat. And, you know, so obviously the virus is spreading rapidly across the world and has severely impacted uh, countries like Italy, Iran, and South Korea. Uh, in, in America, according to the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, on March 13th, there were 1,629 cases with 41 deaths. Now, understandably, there has been a range of responses uh, from people giving uh, little regard to what's happening and others who are just, you know, freaking out. And uh, I feel like this la with this past week, uh, more and more people are taking, obviously, this pandemic more seriously. And so today I thought it, it just kind of made sense. Instead of going through 1 Samuel, uh, we would address uh, the concern uh, of the coronavirus and how the Christian is to respond to it. And the question I want to address is the question of fear. Should we be afraid? In the book of The Weight of Glory, there's a copy of C.S. Lewis's sermon, uh, which was given near the beginning of World War II. And it was a time when people were afraid. And this is what he said. It's an extended quote, so uh, bear with me. It says, he says, The third enemy is fear. War threatens us with death and pain. No man, and especially no Christian who remembers Gethsemane, need try to attain a stoic indifference about these things. But we can guard against the illusions of the imagination. We think of the streets of Warsaw in contrast to deaths there suffered with an abstraction called life. But there's no question of death or life for any of us, only a question of this death or of that, of a machine gun bullet now or a cancer 40 years later. What does war do to death? It certainly does not make it more frequent. 100% of us die and the percentage cannot be increased. It puts several deaths earlier, but I hardly suppose that there that that is what we fear. Certainly when the moment comes, it will make little difference how many years we have behind us. Does it increase our chance of a painful death? I doubt it. As far as I can find out, what we call natural death is usually preceded by suffering. And a battlefield is one of the very few places where one has a reasonable prospect of dying with no pain at all. Does it decrease our chances of dying at peace with God? I cannot believe it. If active service does not persuade a man to prepare for death, what conceivable concatenation of circumstances would. Yet war does do something to death. It forces us to remember it. The only reason why the cancer at 60 or the paralysis at 75 do not bother us is that we forget them. War makes death real to us, and that would have regarded as one of its blessings by most of the great Christians of the past. 
They thought it good for us to, to be always aware of our mortality. I'm inclined to think that they were right. All the animal life in us, all schemes of happiness as centered in this world, were always doomed to a final frustration. In ordinary times, only a wise man can realize it. Now the stupidest of us know. We see unmistakably the sort of universe in which we have all along been living and must come to terms with it. If we had a foolish, unchristian hopes about, about human culture, they are now shattered. If we thought we were building up a heaven on earth, if we looked for something that would turn the present world from a place of pilgrimage into a permanent city satisfying the soul of man, we are disillusioned and not a moment too soon. But if we thought that for some souls, and that sometimes the life of learning humbly, bef uh, humbly offered to God was, in its own small way, one of the appointed approaches to the divine reality and the divine beauty which we hope to enjoy hereafter, we can think so still. And Lewis, Lewis was right. When we as a community and even as a country come face to face with the threats of war and natural disasters like tsunamis and earthquakes or diseases like the coronavirus, we're reminded of our mortality. We're reminded of the fact that we're human beings. These threatening powers don't in any way change the inevitability of death. No matter what, we're going to die. And so all that something like the coronavirus does is that it helps us remember that we are going to die so that we stop living as if we're going to live forever. So going back to the question, should we be afraid? And the answer is yes. Apart from God, we should be afraid. It's logical and rational to embrace fear and worry when you're reminded of death so that in response, you might do what you need to do in order to preserve your life. Think about this. How bizarre would it be if someone stood in front of a tornado and was not afraid? He didn't care to save his life. Didn't think that he had to run away. We will label that man as somebody who is disconnected from reality, somebody who is crazy. It is reasonable and rational to have a fear that increases in correspondence with the escalation of danger. And if that danger is death, then it makes sense for people to give themselves over to frenzy, despair, and anxiety. And really, that's the fundamental fear behind the coronavirus. It's not the prospect of getting sick, but it's the prospect of getting sick and not recovering. So whereas some people might label the overly fear fearful as being disconnected from reality, in actuality, the fearful have never been so connected to reality as they are now. The reality that they are a mortal people. And it's terrifying to realize that we are destined to die. Lewis said, all the animal life, like he said, all the animal life in us, all the schemes of happiness that centered in this world, were always doomed to a final frustration, always doomed to a final frustration. In ordinary times, only a wise man can realize it. Now, the stupidest, stupidest of us know. And so, many of us know. But the reason why the sobering realization of death is good is because we begin to approach our lives in a way that is profound and not superficial. We don't, go, we don't go around living la-di-da about life or complain about the uh, trivialities of first world problems or start building our own kingdom in this world as if we're going to live forever on this earth. Instead, we begin to ask the questions about life and death. And that's why Solomon, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 4, he says, The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. See, when we see death, we begin to ask the meaningful questions about life. Whether there is such a thing as purpose. Is there meaning to all of this? Whether there is life beyond this life? Whether or not God exists? And in pursuing the answers to these questions, we come to understand, actually, the nature and the reason for death itself. The scriptures teach that we are not a product of time and chance, but we have been created by God as the image bearers of God for the purpose of glorifying God for all of eternity. But it was sin that blinded us from our created purpose and corrupted the image of God within us, killing us spiritually. And it is this spiritual death that we have within us because of sin that leads to physical death. The reason why we die is because we're spiritually dead on the inside. The reason why we are spiritually dead is because of sin. So as terrifying as the problem, as a problem of disease and death might be, they're actually just symptoms of a real problem. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 13, it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world, through one man, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. The word of God says that the reason why there is death in this world is because of sin. When Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he violated the commandment of God, sin entered into this world, corrupting everything, including Adam's soul and his posterity. And it's that spiritual corruption that has led to the physical decay of everything in this world. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 20 to 22, it says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. It's not only humanity that has fallen, but all of creation. And this, look, this is not theoretical. This is actual. This is something that we have experienced in, as a human race. In, in, in 2010, an earthquake hit Haiti, killing over 200,000 people. In 2011, a powerful tsunami hit Japan. You guys, some of you, I think majority of you guys remember that. Killing over 15,000 people and causing the meltdown of nuclear reactors. In 2020, right now, the coronavirus has spread across nearly every continent. The natural disasters and epidemics that have devastated and scourged the world testify to the deep brokenness of creation, a brokenness that finds its genesis in sin. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that God is punishing people for their personal sins with disease or physical handicaps or natural disasters. So you can't look at the coronavirus and think, no, God's doing all of this in order to judge the world for their unbelief. You can't, you can't think that. In John chapter 9, verse 2 to 3, it says, And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. There are times when God punishes individuals and nations with plagues for disobedience, but we cannot automatically conclude that when a person suffers, he's done some wrong things. He's sinned against God. What we can say for certain, however, is that the pain that we suffer is the result of the brokenness as resulted from Adam's transgression against the commandments of God. That will be true always, regardless of time or situation. The reason why this revelation is critical is because it directs our fear to the more fundamental threat, that is the threat of sin. Because the problem of sin doesn't just lead to disease and, and death, but it extends beyond to the realm of hell. Man, so man's fear of disease, it, it directs our attention to death. That's why we're afraid of it. But death looks back to sin that precedes the disease because it all begins with sin. But sin projects our eyes past the disease, past the end of of death itself and to the eternal horizon of hell. See, the real problem of man is not the infection of the body, but it's the infection of the soul that damns the soul. So the horrors of the coronavirus is meant to point us to the incomprehensible terrors of hell that await humanity beyond the borders of death. The world's fear, anxiety, and hysteria is not incongruent with the current pandemic because the response is commensurate with the prospect of death to which the disease naturally directs our perspective. And we, we're afraid of death. We're all afraid of death. But the unsettling reality is that there is a power even before which death trembles, a power that would elicit a fear that is more paralyzing, an anxiety that is more unstable, a hysteria that is more chaotic than whatever the people are experiencing right now. And that power is hell. So from a biblical perspective, we realize that the world is not desperate enough. The world is not depressed enough. The world is not scared enough about the product of sin because the final product of sin is not death. It is the hell to which death leads. That's for this very reason why the Christian can rejoice in times like this. Our experience of suffering like the world directs our attention forward to death. And that's actually spiritually good for some of us who get caught up in the every days of life, or we try to build up our kingdom here. It's, it's good for us to remember that we're not going to be here for all of eternity. Now, the reality of death, it guides our perspective back to the problem of sin, which is the origin, again, of all this chaos. And sin leads us forward again past the suffering and even death so that we might be able to see the realities of hell. But hell directs our focus and our perspective up to God who is in control of all of these things. And we entrust ourselves to God, who will redeem us from all this corruption, including sin, suffering, grave, and damnation. Our Creator, in His great love for us, He sent Jesus Christ into this world. And it was Jesus who bore our sins upon the cross, so He suffered the torments and the anguish of this broken world, and simultaneously endured the outpouring of divine wrath that should have been poured out upon us. And then He finally gave Himself over to death, humanity's undertaker who should have buried our souls in hell. Jesus was sacrificed so that we might be forgiven of our sins and delivered from the wrath of God. But three days later, he resurrected from the dead. 
and he inaugurated a new creation, a new creation that begins with the image bearers of God. A spiritual life, a new creation of a spiritual life that we have in union with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this new life that we have is freed from the corruption of sin. It's freed from the oppression and the rule of sin that has once dominated our lives. In Romans chapter 6, verse 17 to 18, it says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Sin no longer has a right to our souls. Sin no longer has claim to our lives. But the message of the gospel goes even further and it says that the fulfillment of the spiritual resurrection is a physical resurrection from the dead unto a new life, an eternal life, that is not only freed from the power of sin, but is freed from the presence of sin. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, it says, So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. But the resurrection of the believer not only transforms the individual, but it transforms the entire world. It transforms creation. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and let's read together verse 18 to 22. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 22. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from his bondage to corruption and attain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. In the same way that the fall of humanity plunged the world into corruption, so the redemption of humanity lifts the world into freedom. Our resurrection from the dead will lead to the resurrection of the world. Like our own bodies, heaven and earth will die and will rise up as a new creation. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 to 13, it says, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The world that will be recreated will be a world that will be liberated from the corruption of sin. So that I'll be freed from the brokenness of the natural disasters that we experience right now. The diseases that ravages us right now. The new creation will even be purged from the blight of death. And our bodies will be no longer susceptible to pain and decay because sin was crucified upon the cross in the person of Jesus Christ. And whatever, and the remnant of sin that remained in our sinful flesh will have been buried deep inside the earth, an earth which in turn will have been consumed by the fire of God's wrath. God will burn our sin nature as he burns the heavens and the earth so that we will be free from the sufferings of sin. And that's why in the new world, there will no longer be sorrow. In Revelation chapter 21 verse 4, it says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. See, the reason why the Christian can face the brokenness of creation, and the reason why we can live without fear, is because the eternal problem of hell that lies behind the object of our fears, the fear of world war, the fear of natural disasters, the fear of a pandemic, the fear of death, the problem of hell has been dealt with by the gospel. See, whatever terror that we suffer in this world is just a drop. It's just a drop in the sea of anguish in which the world is destined to drown. And yet it was our Lord Jesus Christ who swallowed up the sea when he drank the cup. And that's why the church is called in the face of all kinds of threat, in the midst of all kinds of panic, to move forward in hope and a steady joy, knowing that we have a salvation that cures us from a disease that doesn't attack the body but has killed the soul. It makes sense for the world to panic at the face of death. But it doesn't make sense for the Christian. When the Apostle Paul was in prison in the Roman dungeon, when this man was in chains, he sought to comfort the church in Philippi. And he said this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 to 21. Brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. 
For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. See, this is our hope, and this is our joy. No matter what the circumstances might be, we can rest in the power of the gospel. Whether we live in persecution against the faith that we hold to, or whether we live in the turmoil of natural disasters, we set our eyes on the gospel of Jesus Christ, which has not only saved us from sin, but will save us from this fallen creation. And so in the next few verses, Paul says from verse four through seven, chapter 4, verse 4 through 7, Rejoice in the Lord always, always. I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. So going back to the question, should we be afraid? The answer is no. Because the problem of sin has been dealt with by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the comfort that we have as Christians. Now, our response to the coronavirus shouldn't just shift our perspective inwards so that we only think about ourselves and how we need to deal with it ourselves, but it should, it should um, shift our perspective outwards so that we begin to care about those in the community, those within the church. As I said before, natural disasters and viral outbreaks like this cause people to think about things that really matter. I mean, you can't even distract yourself with the NBA because it's suspended. Can't even go to Disneyland, it's, you know, it's closed down. Um, and so, as frightening as this whole thing might be for some people, it presents an opportunity for the church, for us, to minister to the world that is physically and emotionally um, ready for something like this. And to point them to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to show them that the real problem is not the problem of a, of a virus, but the problem of sin. And that the real hope that can be available to them is not the hope of a recovery, but the hope of a resurrection. Those who have been apathetic may finally wake up to the fact that it makes sense for them to care about questions like the meaning of life as they experience the ultimate meaninglessness of their education and career as their schools shut down or as the economy suffers. Or those who have been hostile to the faith may finally realize that the object of their contempt may be the only hope that they have in the face of dark oblivion. From 1846 to 1860, there was a cholera pandemic that ravaged the world. And um, I pulled up an excerpt from Wikipedia, so it's not deep research on my part. <laughs> so it says this. Third cholera pandemic from 1846 to 60 was the third major outbreak of cholera originating in India in the 19th century that reached far beyond its borders, which researchers at UCLA believe may have started as early as 1837 and lasted until 1863. In Russia, more than one million people died of cholera. In 1853 to 1854, the epidemic in London claimed over 10,000 lives, and there were 23,000 deaths for all of Great Britain. This pandemic was considered to have the highest fatalities of the 19th century epidemics. Now, in Spurgeon's autobiography, he gives an account of his experience with this outbreak in London in 1854. And he personally ministered to the sick. He went uh, to the houses of his congregation members in order to care for them, in order to pray for them, in order to be there for them. Well, one day at 3 o'clock in the morning, he got a call to make a visitation, and he didn't know who, who it was for until he actually went to the house, and he saw the man lying there literally on his deathbed. And he recognized this individual as somebody who mocked him and opposed the Christian faith. And Spurgeon said, That man in his lifetime had been wont to jeer at me. In strong language, he had often denounced me as a hypocrite. Yet he was no sooner smitten by the darts of death than he sought my presence and counsel, no doubt feeling in his heart that I was a servant of God, though he did not care to own it with his lips. The prospect of death will humble some of the proudest and the most arrogant men so that they will realize that they are not smart enough, they are not strong enough, and they are not rich enough to escape death. And they may for the first time in their fear listen to the gospel. After the third cholera pandemic, there was a fourth that again ravaged London, and Spurgeon gave a sermon, and it was entitled, Fields White for Harvest. 
and he gave it, obviously, in the midst of all the fear and the suffering. And uh, again, this is an extended quote. This is what he said. I remember when I first came to London, how anxiously people listened to the gospel, for the cholera was raging terribly. There was little scoffing then. All day and sometimes all night long, I went about from house to house and saw men and women dying, and oh, how glad they were to see one's face, and when many were afraid to enter the houses for fear of disease. We who had no fear about such things found ourselves most gladly listened to when we spoke of Christ and of divine things. And now again is the minister's time. Now is the time for all of you who love souls. You may see men more alarmed than now. I hope they may not be. I pray to God that they may not be. But if they should, avail yourselves of it. You have the balm of Gilead. When their wounds smart, pour it in. You know him, you know of him who died to save. Tell them of him. Lift high the cross before their eyes. Tell them that God became man, that man might be lifted up to God. Tell them of Calvary and its groans and cries and sweats and sweat of blood. Tell them of Jesus hanging on the cross to save sinners. Tell them that there is a life for a look at the crucified one. Tell them that he is able to save to the uttermost of uh, uttermost all of uh, all them who come unto God by him. Tell them that he is able to save at the eleventh hour and to say to the dying thief, Today shall you be with me in paradise. Church, this is our mission. Okay, this is our mission. No matter what the season might be, we are called to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, our King and our Savior. People are dying, but an outbreak doesn't change that fact. It just helps them realize it. And so the church, we are not to cower and live in fear of what might happen, not only because we have the peace of the gospel and we have the hope of eternal life, but because this is the opportune time to extend the hope of the gospel to some, some of those who have finally come to understand their mortality. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, it says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Let us be a people who share this glory to those who may be suffering. Now as we boldly move as a church, um, it doesn't mean that we are to move foolishly. The reason why we're resorting to this live streaming is to continue our worship of God and at the same time uh, limit the potential for the virus to spread. Now, we don't, we don't know exactly how long we're going to be doing this. Um, and to be honest, I, I definitely prefer preaching to you guys in person. I'm like cracking jokes and nobody's laughing. <laughs> Except, so I don't know if it's funny or not. You know what I'm saying? Uh, 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 but in any case, I, I'd rather much be preaching, preaching in front of you guys. Uh, so I don't know how long this is going to be. So we just don't know. So we got we to prep ourselves for this. Uh, so for community life, things are going to be different with this digital form of worship and fellowship. And what that means is that everybody, you guys, you guys have to step up. We all have to step up and get involved in different ways. Obviously, this is a new territory for, um, for everyone. But I want to encourage you guys to be creative and to be proactive. So continue having your prayer meetings, continue having your accountability, but do it through FaceTime or something. Um, you know, build relationships with your Christian roommates. Maybe up until this point, you just kind of had a, um, a very superficial relationship with them. You just kind of coexisted with, under the same roof. And what better time than now to deepen those relationships and to forge a brotherhood or sisterhood? Even though this whole social distancing thing kind of makes things weird and um, difficult for us, um, let it be an opportunity for us to step up and take ownership, even more ownership of our church. And I, I know many of you guys have already done that, and I'm really encouraged and thankful for that. I really wish I could see you guys uh, face to face. Um, now, with regards to people both inside and outside the church who may have um, become infected, we are called to love our neighbors, even if it comes with risks. Okay? When our Lord Jesus Christ, He came into this world to save us from our sins, He came not simply understanding the risks, the possibility of the dangers. He came down into this world understanding the surety of those dangers. Suffering, betrayal, damnation, and death, those weren't things, those weren't matters of ifs. It was a matter of when. But even then, he descended and he came to us a man. So to live consistently with the gospel, therefore, is to first have a heart that understands the sacrificial love of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sacrificial love that we have received from God so that we might be able to extend that same love to those who might be suffering. All of us were called to have that heart, okay? No matter what, we're called to have that kind of heart where we're willing to give 
and where we're, where we're willing to serve, even if it comes at our own expense. And I hope that this whole pandemic might help you to examine whether or not this is true of you. Um, do you have this kind of heart? Do you have this kind of heart? Are you in a place where you will be willing to put yourself at risk for the sake of ministering and helping someone else? And um, the self-examination, that kind of self-examination should challenge, I think, all of us to see that we have much to grow. Um, and even though that might seem impossible, Christ works in us. God works in us. Not by our own strength can we do something like this, but by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The more we behold, you guys know this, the more we behold the glory of Jesus in the gospel, the more we'll be conformed and transformed into His image. And the more we become like Christ, I guarantee you that we will be able to love as Christ is loved because it will be Him loving through us. Jesus Christ is the archetype of sacrificial love and we will be conformed into His image. Now the willingness to sacrifice, I do want to say this though, it's not the same thing as living foolishly or recklessly. Wisdom dictates that we try to do our best to care for others while being good stewards of everything that God has given to us, especially the, this life that God has created and redeemed by the blood of Christ. And so I hope that all of us will spend some time thinking and will spend some time praying uh, to consider the most effective ways in which we can help our church and also reach out to the community. So um, if you guys have any great ideas, you know, feel free to, to message me and let me know. All right? And... Uh, I think, yeah, that's it. That's all I got to say. Uh, thanks again, guys, for tuning in. Smash that like button. <laughs> I'm, just <playing. laughs> I'm just playing. And let me, let me pray for us, and we'll, uh, I'll ask Brian to uh, come and close us in the time of worship. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you again for uh, the time that we have to, to worship you. Um, God, it's, it's so good that we can even come together in this uh, unconventional way uh, through media but that is a gift from you and Lord I pray for our congregation that you will continue to comfort them um, comfort them and help give them perspective of the gospel of Jesus Christ that has uh, taken care of the problem of sin and even delivered us from the power of hell itself so that we might be able to move forward on this earth with great confidence that we have a hope that transcends whatever we have in this world, even if that is our own lives. And Lord, give us um, uh, a heart of Christ. And Lord, uh, we know that we cannot minister as you by our own strength, but we can do it by Christ, the power of Christ. So would your grace be upon us. Thank you again for your great love. Thank you for your mercies. And Lord, would you Take all the glory for yourself. We pray this in Jesus' name. the 
Let me in a time of benediction. Now may the grace and peace of God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit be upon everyone here who entrusts themselves to the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, guys. I'll see you at uh, 6 o'clock. <laughs>